want something kind of unique, but now it sounds like every time you turn around, there's someone named Bryce now. I don't know. But uh, I want to welcome Jim Jessup up uh, with the partnership we've had with William Jessup University over the years. Uh, Jim's going to come up and give the message here today. Um, he just has a way with connecting with people. Um, I know when I talked to my son last time he was here, he goes, I really like Jim. He really connects with me. So, Jim, welcome. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> I appreciate you, man. <laughs> Petaluma family, look at you. You look good. Turn to somebody and say, you look good. <laughs> yeah, all right. So, some of you just weren't good. Yeah, you just, yeah. Um, many of you are probably like, I don't know this guy. I don't know that I've ever seen him. It's been two years since I was here. Yeah, isn't that something? Uh, and it's such a joy to be back with you. I, I write down in my notes, you know, when I preached and what I preached so I don't come back and tell you the same things every time. And, um, yeah, I looked in my, in my Petaluma Christian Church file, and it was 2022 that I was here. And, boy, time flies. And it is such a joy to be with you. And you know what I love most is that while I see a lot of you that I recognize, you're getting older. <laughs> I, I am too. I have less hair every time I come. But it's all the new faces. This is so cool. I love seeing. Yeah. You guys. Um, and I tell you what, if this is your first time in here, now I am a guest preacher. You need to come back and hear Ryan, okay? If this doesn't go well today, uh, I won't be here next week, all right? So uh, the pastor of this church, uh, when he first got installed, I came over and took him out to lunch. And uh, I've done that for 21 years now at the colleges. I've been training pastors like Maximus, who preached for you last Sunday, just a senior in college. Didn't he do a good job? Man, I know. I wish I could take more credit. He was in my preaching class last semester. And, uh, and so that sermon, in fact, that he brought you was one that he worked on in the class. And I told him, Maximus, you're picking a verses out of Romans. That's a tough book to preach from. And didn't he handle it well? The grace of God through the faith in Jesus Christ that you have, not by works that you are saved, but because of the grace that he preached so well to you, God's word. Because of the grace, it would compel you to works. It would compel you to do good works. And I thought he'd got a message across really clear with God's word last week. And so thanks for receiving him. And he's really, his confidence is really growing. I watched it uh, uh, this week on uh, YouTube. And it's so fun to critique my guys as they're out there. For, for those of you who are uh, new, I just want you to know William Jessup University. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the school. So you who are uh, longtime friends of ours, uh, you're going to hear a few stories that are similar, okay, that you've heard before. But for the new folks, uh, you just uh, put up with me, would you? And so the new folks will understand what a great relationship we have. Over in Rockland is our main campus. Let's see. We have a picture. There it is. We have a picture. Those are the students on the front of the campus. I love showing this picture, even though it's a few years old. Some of you will even recognize in the second to the left this man from South Africa, Sive, he used to come and preach for you a bunch. Remember him? Yeah, and uh, that picture was taken on our 80th anniversary. We're actually having our 85th this fall, and we'll gather again on the ramp. But I like showing that one because for new folks, you see the little inset? That was 1939 when my grandfather started San Jose Bible College, okay? And that's how many students he had. Uh, when he got the school started. And now we're up over 1,600. We have a campus in San Jose that's a leased facility for adults to study at night. And just recently, we received the Multnomah University campus in Portland. In other words, they were dying, and they reached out to us and said, would you help? And so that is now Jessup University campus in Rockland, the Multnomah Extension. And uh, so we hope to have somewhere around 400 students this fall at the Multnomah campus. And I brought uh, magazines along with me. They're out there on the table. This is the uh, director of the program up in Portland, and that's our current president, John Jackson. And I also brought a little pennant. I'd love for you to take a pennant home, throw it on your fridge, and when you go grab a snack, you can, oh, yeah, Lord, be with the, be with the university. So uh, help yourself to a pennant, would you? They're all free there, and I won't even pass an offering plate. So, um, because you guys have supported us, check this out. Look at this next slide. 
Do you see the date? Can you read it from there? It says 1945. You guys started, and actually, I think you started supporting us right when we got started at 1939, but we didn't have any records. I mean, my grandpa tried to keep it on sheets of paper, and it was amazing. And then we got a computer, and you have given thousands of dollars to our scholarship fund. And I want to say thank you. You have made a huge difference in the lives of students over the years including some that you would remember, such as C. Vey, who preached here some, but you had a pastor for a while named Wayne Bigelow. Remember, you, old, you oldsters, you know Wayne, yes. And, and um, before him, you had, um, uh, he's in Santa Rosa. Oh, now I'm getting old. Rod Bowman, thank you, Rodney Bowman. He's an alumni of ours. Okay, I'll stop with the reminiscing. I'm sorry, I'm gonna bore you. Anyways, isn't that cool? Thank you that you care about Christian higher ed. We are still training pastors and missionaries and, and Christian leaders for the church. But you know what? We have now 50, five zero, different programs. And if I hadn't told you lately, we have a nursing program that has exploded. We're up to about 65 students this fall in the nursing program, a BSN in nursing. We have hospital rooms on campus now with mannequins in every one of the beds. And they breathe. And they, they, they have a blood pressure, and their eyes dilate and blink, and they moan and groan. And it is eerie. It really is. And we have, and we have one that gives birth, a mannequin that gives birth. And the little baby is electronic, too. And it comes out screaming, and it comes out with a heartbeat and everything. It's amazing. I don't want to watch it, but it's amazing. And so God is blessing that we have simulators on campus for our aviation program now. Uh, so you can get your pilot's license while you get your uh, bachelor's degree in aviation. We have some 35 students in that program. God is doing some wonderful things by Christian professors using God's word as the foundation of their faith and what they teach while they give all of this practical stuff that students can use this for their future in wherever God calls them, whether it's in the church or in society or wherever, they can make a difference for the kingdom. And you're a part of that, Petaluma, and I thank you so much, man, really do. And I hope that you feel blessed by the fact that God has blessed you with a great man in Ryan as your pastor, by the way. Uh, I started to tell you that I went to lunch with him when he first came. He was so receptive to me. He has been inviting our, our preachers back whenever he is in need of, of a preacher or just to take a break. And thank you for receiving us and uh, for holding on to him. I have 18 churches right now, 18 that are looking for a pastor. Yeah. Well, I'm in touch with about, um, about 1,500 churches now, the college is. 1,500 churches that contact us, stay in touch with us. And it is not easy to be a pastor these days. So cut him some slack, okay? Be nice to him. You won't always agree with what he's doing. Um, it, it, because we can't all agree. Amen? You with me? Yeah. I mean, Brian, you did an awesome job in music, but not everyone's going to like your music, buddy. You know it? <laughs> And so you stay firm, you just keep, it, it was all about the Lord, that music was, all about the Lord. So if you don't like it, come back next Sunday, maybe there'll be a different song and you'll like it then. But join in for what God is doing and Petaluma will be so much better for it. For the church in unity can do great things and it's so cool to see you guys growing. Hey, listen, I didn't want to elongate a commercial. I, I just want to challenge you, I want to encourage you. Um, in fact, the first slide here, I think it says right there, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, I want to talk to you about the power of your example. This church is over 150 years old. Did you, did you all know that? Some of you new folks might not realize that. I mean, some of the people in here look 50. Uh, no, no, you don't look 150. <laughs> 150 years old. I was here for your 150th celebration. It was really cool. Some of the old pastors came back, you know, the ones who were still alive. And, and we had a wonderful celebration. But you've had an example, and you now have a powerful example in how you live. Paul told the church in Corinth, okay, in this letter in 1 Corinthians, this is just a short verse, and I've got a few other verses for you, but I've got a lot of stories. He told the church, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now, why would he say that? Do you realize that where you sit right now, you either probably can access a Bible, in fact, yeah, they're underneath every one of the chairs, or you can pull out your phone and you can pull up your Bible app. 
You realize that when they met in the church in Corinth, they didn't have that. There was no Bibles yet for them to hold on to, for them to read. They only knew what they heard. You with me? It was being written. This was one of the letters that was then compiled for the Bible around 350 A.D. as the Bible was put together. Follow my example. Why would he say that? Because here he was teaching the church a bunch of things that they should do and how they should live if there is Christ who died for them, how they should live. Finally, I think it probably almost in exasperation, it was, look, just follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And every preacher who would stand up here, hopefully what we're doing is we're trying to point you to follow after Christ, not us, because I make a lot of mistakes. And and Ryan's going to make mistakes. But you know what? You do too. We make a lot of mistakes. But if we don't realize that we have great power in our example, then how will people who will never pick up God's word ever understand who God is but by watching you? You may be the only Bible some people will ever read. Let me say that again because that went for some of you. You, the way in which you live, act and react to the world, you may be the only Bible some people will ever read. Or they'll never pick up God's word, but they know you're a Christian, and they know that your life is supposed to emulate that which you believe and who you believe in. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ because there is such power in example. Let me give you this first little truth statement here, this next slide. We model what we value. We model what we value. Now, this is not a statement that is a principle for you to take home and try to live out. You're already doing it. This is a truth statement that every human being that has ever breathed has lived out. You model what you value. If if I were to go home with you today, some of you would not like that, but if I were to go home with you today and I would say, hey, uh, show me your checkbook. Show me your statements online. Let me, look, let me look at your banking online. Can you just show it to me? Hey, um, show me around your house. Hey, can I go to work with you tomorrow? I want to see where you work or what, what you do at work. Hey, introduce me to some of your friends. Hey, show me some of the things that you call your possessions that you really like. It would only take me a while for me to understand what you value. And, and it's people who are watching you who quickly understand what you value because you model it. Whether you're a Christ follower or you're just going after whatever the world has to offer, you model what you value. Can you give me a nod every once in a while? You agree with me? If you don't agree, well, I keep looking because all you got to do is look around and you can see people model what they value. So with that in mind, I I got a few family stories for you, okay, because I know there's a lot of new faces and I want you to know kind of why I am the way I am. And maybe you'll see why you are the way you are because of people who have influenced you. See, if I were to ask you how you came to Christ, I interviewed you, interviewed you, one-on-one interview, you might say, well, I came to the Lord because of this one great song that I heard, man, it put me over the edge. Or this great sermon that I heard, I walked forward, man, and I accepted the Lord. Or I was reading the Bible, and there was this one verse, and boom, that was it. And that made the decision for my life to follow Christ. You might have a lot of reasons why you made that final decision to follow after Christ, but I bet you every one of you would say, but there was this person in my life. Stop and think about it. It might have been a parent. It might have been a sibling. It might have been a friend. It might have been a coworker. But there was someone maybe they're in this church, who was living out a faith, and you thought, I like that. I I want that. I see joy in them, and I see hope in them. They were living a life of an example of the faith that they had. And now do you understand the power you have? The power you have in your life, if you put your hope in Christ, your faith in him, the power of example for this faith to continue. Let me show you these pictures here real quick. We'll go quick on these stories, but the far left is my great-grandparents, Calvin and Matilda Jessup. I never knew them. I do have Matilda's diary, and I do have uh, some stories. 
And here's the first story of the power of example. There, he was an elder at the church in Ceres, Ceres Christian Church, which still exists today. It's moved to the outskirts of town. It used to be downtown. That's Modesto, Turlock, you know, all that area down there. Okay. And he lived at the Keys exit. If you ever go down Highway 99 and you're curious to check up on me, take the Keys exit and go right. Go two streets and you come to Jessup Road. Yeah. And that house that, that was taken is still there. It's his land was sold to this grain operation, so they got huge grain elevators. But if you go through all their, all their programs and everything, and you get to their little house at the end, back towards the freeway, and that house is still there. He was an elder at the Ceres Christian Church, very early 1900s. Went out to the stable on a Sunday morning to hook up the horses to take Matilda and his six kids, of which my grandpa, William Jessup, was the youngest, to take them to church. He got out to the stable... He found out the horses had escaped. They were gone. He called out to them. They didn't come back. He walked back into the house. He said to Matilda and the kids, we're walking to church. And church was about three and a half miles into downtown Ceres. Well, first of all, if you got out to your car this morning and it was missing, would you still go to church? <laughs> I just, I don't know if I would, you know. But anyways, that's beside the point. So they're walking to church. And when they get to the church, what do they find? The horses. And he deduced the horses were so used to going to church that when they got lost, that's where they went. What a powerful example. Are you with me? Are you with me? I, but what a powerful example that even your animals are watching your life. And you know it to be true, don't you? I mean, your cat knows when it's going to get fed. Your dog, they hear the sound, right? I mean, they know and they're watching you when it's time for a walk. Everybody's learning by your example. Even your animals are watching you. Powerful example. They prayed that William Jessup, their youngest boy, would become a pastor. Calvin died when my grandpa was only 17 years old. That would be enough right there to cause a young man to give up on God. Why'd you take my dad? What are you doing, God? But Matilda continued to pray for him. He went off to college, and he sat underneath a tree saying, Lord, I just don't know why I'm here, but not my will but yours. If you want me to walk into ministry, I'll walk into ministry. And it's by his example that so much of who I am today is because of how he lived. When I left for seminary in 1989, there was no internet education, so my wife and I hopped in my little Datsun King cab with our six-month-old daughter and went all the way to Illinois, and I was pastoring a small church in Mount Auburn, Illinois, and I was going to seminary in Lincoln, Illinois, and I was a little discouraged, and I get this letter from my grandpa, and it was a wonderful letter, paper letter, not an email, <laughs> and I read it, and I threw it away. The next week, I got another letter. And it was encouraging. I read it, and I threw it away. And the next week, I got another letter. And I thought to myself, I don't think this old boy is going to stop. <laughs> and so I grabbed a manila folder, and, and I put his letters in there because he wrote me every week for two and a half years while we were in Illinois just to tell me, hang in there, Jim. You can do it. God's on your side. He loves you, and I love you. Your grandma loves you. And um, even grandma would write sideways sometimes right here at the bottom on the back side of the page. It was always one piece of paper for over two years. And I don't think he wrote to me saying, you know, someday Jim will hold these up and he'll show some people at a church. I think he just wrote because he knew it would impact my life. And the reason I'm showing them to you now is because maybe... Maybe today, you need to write to somebody. I need to tell them God loves them, man. A little card, a little note. Tell them that God loves them and that you love them too. Because they just might keep it for the rest of their life. He was an example of encouragement. An example of encouragement. I would move home back to California, pastoring a small church in San Jose. Almaden Valley. And my dad and my grandfather and I were asked to speak at a church in Morgan Hill, and some of you oldsters have heard this story. 
We show up in Morgan Hill. The three of us are going to give a team sermon. I was 26 years old at the time. Grandpa was 86 years old. He went first. He finished his message, sat down second row, right-hand side. His message was passing your faith on to the next generations. I got up to speak, and I began to preach many of the things that I had learned from him and from my father and others in my life and family. And I got halfway through my message, and Grandpa had a heart attack and died. My wife yelled out at me. I jumped down and grabbed him, and I began mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. A Boy Scout leader in the audience ran forward, did the compressions. We waited for the ambulance to come, but it was his time to go home. And as I've told you before, no one has died since while I've been preaching. (laughs) So keep breathing. But pretty cool to be able to hear his last sermon, you know. And And for me to put his picture up there and to say, you know, it's because people set an example in my life. This is not a parenting message, by the way. This is about the fact that there are brothers and sisters all around you who are learning from you. And they're watching your life. And you've learned from them. You know, Grandma, by the way, ladies, Grandma was powerful in her prayers. And my dad talks about the days when he was just four years old and Grandpa moved to San Jose to start the college in 1939. My dad was just four years old. And he remembers listening to his, grand, his mother, Carrie Jessup, up there. His mother would walk around the house. They had almost no money. The property was going to be foreclosed on. The taxes were owed. And uh, Gramps wasn't sure how he was going to make this work. And she walked around the house, and he remembers hearing her, quoting, This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. A few minutes later, he would hear her again. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. He'd hear her again a few minutes later. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You know what he learned by watching his mama? He learned you rejoice by choice. That you don't rejoice because of circumstances that you find yourself in, but you can rejoice in the midst of them because you know there is a great and loving God who holds those circumstances and so greatly holds you in the midst of them. Well, I could go on and on about family and about my dad especially because of the influence he was in my life. Ladies, I want you to know my mom taught me a lot about prayer. Man, I don't know how often she looked at me when I was little and said, Jimmy, you better pray. That'll come out of the carpet. (laughs) I learned how to pray, man. But the influence, the influences have been powerful. March of 20, my father and I were headed to Sunnyvale to preach a team sermon. He was 85 years old. He began talking a lot about his home going his graduation someday. He knew that it wouldn't be long when God would call him home. And uh, so I got used to talking with him about it. And um, we talked about good times, and we talked about the fact it'll be pretty cool someday and how God is going to take him home. And he looked at me while I was driving, and he said, you know, it'd be pretty cool if God took me home while you were preaching, just like Grandpa. (laughs) I about drove off the road. I said, no, (laughs) don't be dying while I'm preaching. Uh, it shakes your confidence as a preacher, you know. And he goes, yeah, that was probably hard on you, especially since we were headed to Sunnyvale to preach on that Sunday. He goes, you know, maybe, um, maybe God would uh, take me in Yosemite someday. He loved Yosemite. We went backpacking every summer. Well, July 28th of 2020, just a few months after that conversation, we went on our trip. He made it eight miles up to Vogelsang Lake in the back country of Yosemite. I had his tent set up for him. He climbed into his tent took a little nap, started to fish around the left side of the lake and had a heart attack and died. It was incredible. As I ran over and I held him and wondered what we will do, my buddies went and made a cell phone call from a near mountainside, said the helicopter will be coming in soon. Actually wouldn't come till the next morning. And uh, yeah, I had quite a time to reflect upon the impact that a person can have in your life in my life. Why do I talk to you all about death so much? Do you understand that it's not until you are at peace with death 
that you will truly be at peace in life. For if you are not at peace with death, you will forever be spending all of your life trying not to die. And trying not to die is no way to live. It's not the abundant life that God has given and promises and wants you to have. All around our world, people are simply trying not to die because they fear death. And yet Paul, as we know, the Apostle Paul said, man, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And though I don't want to go home today, and I hope the Lord will let me finish this sermon, I'd love to be around to help others, to watch my grandkids, all of life, that what God has to offer. And yet, I do not fear death. I look forward to it someday to be in a reunion with those I miss and I love. And what a reunion it will be. Amen? Amen. It will be awesome. Not until we are at peace with death that we could truly be at peace in life. And I'm going to challenge you with that statement. For you will model what you value. And if you value just this life, it will be short-lived and not receive, not give back what it has promised you. But in Christ, great promises for an eternal future and an abundant life while you breathe. Well, um, when I got home from Yosemite, I had the unenviable task of um, boxing up my dad's stuff. Mom was in a nursing home. She'd had strokes, and uh, she didn't know what was going on. And so, uh, you know, you, some of you have to go through this stuff, Right? Some of you have been through that when you lose a loved one and, and, and you have to go through their items and you give things to goodwill, you sell things, you give them to other family members. There are certain things I just couldn't get rid of. I walked into his office and, of course, the first thing on his desk was his Bible with a little talk that he had given just three days earlier to the staff at the Adventure Church in Roseville. He titled it, Run the Offense. <laughs> and... Uh, Boy, his Bible meant a lot to him, and he lived it out. Some of the, some of the chapters, look at how dirty and, and, and scribbled book of Colossians. Philippians is the same. Philippians has tape and tear stains and tears. and He loved the book of Philippians and the joy that it brought him. And uh, so he valued that highly, and he modeled it because you model what you value. Also sitting on his desk was this little picture frame of the family. As he prayed for all 27 of us. Now there's 34 of us, I think. And uh, we knew we were being prayed for. Uh, he valued the family. But he also valued some things that made an impact in my life. Like um, he valued baseball. You know, in high school, he was a, so good at it that the St. Louis Browns in the 50s, it was a professional team, um, they recruited him to come play. And he said, no, I, I think God's calling me into ministry. He turned down professional baseball. He's a lefty. He was a first baseman with a great bat. And that glove is so old, man. I remember that when I was a kid. Playing baseball with him, and he, he valued baseball. He valued ham radio. Boy, he loved ham radio. You know what ham radio is? Yeah, he was W6LAB, and I'd hear him down the hall. This is W6LAB, W6 Lima, Alpha, Bravo. W6 Lemons, Apples, and Bananas. This is W6LAB calling CQ. CQ, anybody hear me? And he'd wait. Somebody would get back to him from South America or something, and he'd come bouncing down the hall in later years, and he'd say, I just talked to somebody in South America, Jim. I'd say, I can too, Pop. But he, say, <laughs> but he valued talking with people he didn't even know. He just wanted to meet them and, and greet them. This was in his hand. This is a custom fly rod. This was in his hand when he died on the lake of uh, Vogelsang Lake in the High Sierras. He used to tie his own flies. I still have a bunch of them. And uh, I, I, I thought about putting it together, but I'm a little bit, <laughs> little bit uh, shy here with this low of a ceiling and showing you how beautiful it is. But what he talked about to me as he taught me how to fly fish was the preparation and the placement and the way in which you'd cast that line out Jesus said to Peter, come and follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. And he talked about that with me. 
How else do you present the gospel? And you lay it out there so people can see. And it's exposed. And when they take, take a hold, boy, you bring them to the Lord. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. And, of course, he had a little pennant sitting on his desk, Jessup University. He loved the school. I just show you those things because I wonder to myself as I was putting things in a box, what will somebody who loves me put in my box someday? How will they remember me? What will they put in your box? Huh? What would they put in your box someday? As they go through all of the things that you've acquired in this life, hmm, what will remind them of you? You model what you value. You model what you value. Okay, quickly, a couple of the quick pictures here, and then I got a couple points for you, and I'm going to send you out of here. In 1975, uh, my grandfather climbs Half Dome and stood on his head on his 70th birthday. It was silly. It was silly, but he loved to climb to high places, stand on his head, and just thank God for the life he's given. But because he did that, my uncle, his oldest son in 2002, would climb Half Dome on his 70th birthday. Therefore, my father would climb on his 70th birthday. You know what I'll do when I'm 70? Um, and I'll climb that dome again. And uh, it's be why? Because it's an example set. And I look forward more to sitting on that rock right there behind where we stand on our head and thanking God for what he's done. There are silly traditions. There are silly things that you are doing that people are watching. And they may emulate you. It might be your kids, might be friends, whatever. But you have a reason for it. You're going to model what you value. And you know, the Placer Herald picked up the story when my dad climbed it. And check out this slide here. The Placer Herald is a newspaper in our county. It said, one half dome meets another. <laughs> Why? Because, the, I mean, society is like, what are you doing? Here's the president of the college at the time, and he's climbing half dome to stand on his head, okay? Folks, do you understand? That's the way many people are looking at what we're doing right now. Why are you at this church listening to some guy ramble on about a God you cannot see? You with me? Yeah, and they're thinking, he's never done anything for me. My life stinks. If there's a God, he would love me. Maybe some Sundays you walk in here and you feel the same way. If there's really a God, why did I lose my job? Why did I lose my spouse? Why is my kid sick? Why am I sick? Why is this happening? I want you to understand, sometimes the world's going to look at our faith and say, you're silly. I want to challenge you. You're a powerful example if you do not give up doing what is right. And God will reward when you continue to have faith in him that he's going to work things out for the good of those who love the Lord. Okay, so quick, two quick things, and I'm all, I'm all done. I'll wrap this up. Two quick things. Let's show. Value people over things. If, if you really do model what you value, which is true, then make sure you're valuing people over things. That verse, Hebrews 13, 5, powerful verse. If you're into memorizing verses, and you should be because it helps you to stay faithful to God, keep your life free from the love of money. Did you catch that? It's not keep your life free from money. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. What a powerful, powerful promise from the Lord. If we keep our life free from money, and how do we keep our life free from money? By being content with what we have because we know God will give us what we need. And he will, he will come through. It, it, it's tough though, isn't it? Man, it's tough. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. To keep that in mind that God is always there. You know, Jesus spent more time talking about money and possessions than heaven and hell combined. Do you realize that? He spent more time talking about money and possessions than heaven and hell combined. Some guy named Randy Alcorn who wrote a book called The Treasure Principle, he actually counted all the verses. So that's not just some general statement. Jesus really did spend more time talking about money and possessions than heaven and hell combined. Why would he do that? Why would he talk about the temporal over the eternal? Because he knew the temporal would guide you. It would guide you. If you were not careful, you would begin to worship creation instead of the creator. 
Keep your life free from the love of money. It's not wrong to have the things that money can buy as long as in the process we don't lose the things money can't buy. That was Jim Elliott, a famous missionary. It's not wrong to have the things that money can buy as long as in the process you don't lose the things money can't buy. And so many people are losing the relationships and losing the uh, faith that they have in God because money has become their God. And it becomes so powerful in their lives. This one guy bought himself a brand new Bentley. You know what a Bentley is? Luxury. Man, I'm talking ultra expensive car. He's in this thing. He's cruising along. First time out, he didn't realize how powerful it was too. He's flying along the road. The road turned. He missed the turn. He rolled that thing. It flipped over and over. He got ejected from the car. He comes out. Oh, my Bentley, my Bentley, he's yelling. My Bentley, the a cop saw him, comes on over. He says, sir, are you okay? And he goes, yes, but my Bentley, my Bentley. The cop says, sir, you're missing your left arm. He looks down and goes, oh, my Rolex, my Rolex, you know. <laughs> That's a bad joke. But we can, get so, we can get so wrapped up, can't we, in the stuff, man. You get so wrapped up in the stuff, you forget what's really of eternal Value, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if we were to watch someone's life, you could quickly see what they treasure, and we see their heart will follow. At the time John Rockefeller died, he was one of the wealthiest men on earth. And a story goes that someone asked his accountant, how much did John leave? His accountant replied, all of it. And so will you. You know, the craziest thing is when I got back to my dad's house and I walked inside, nothing was missing. He took nothing with him except the relationships that he would have past and into the future. And it's kind of sobering to be reminded of that, isn't it? It's why you never see a Hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. Value. Value the present over the past. That's number two, and then we're wrapped, up, we're wrapped up here. Value the present over the past. Paul said while he was in chains to the church in Philippi, we call it the book of Philippians, he said, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, valuing the present over the past. Mm. What God can do through you today in encouraging you in your faith and what through your faith you can do for others by living out what you believe. Value the present over the past. And some of you might say, Jim, that's easy for you. Look at, look at the life you just shared with us of your parents having faith, living it out. There was integrity. And I thank God for what I got to live under and who I learned from. But some of you haven't had that. And uh, my wife gives me permission to tell you this story. Uh, see, my wife's story is maybe a little bit more like yours for some of you. For some of you, and I hope it will encourage you. She grew up with two different dads in Kansas. Her real dad, who was an alcoholic and a violent alcoholic, and then her stepdad, who was also an alcoholic and became violent. When she would come home from elementary school, she'd often be the one who'd have to call the cops to break up a fight between her mom and dad. I never knew anything like that. That was just not, that was so foreign to me. God was in the home, and my parents loved each other, but some of you, unfortunately, you grew up like that. And then, early age, her grandfather, who was her only real father figure, began to molest her. And that will mess up your view of God. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it will also really mess up a marriage. Seven years into our marriage, she finally came to grips with what had happened in the past and was able to begin to heal to move into the future. When she heard this one preacher, we were listening to him together, and we'll never forget what he said. And it was a powerful statement, and I share it with you. It's, it's 
Maybe steps on your toes a little, but hold on to it if you would. He said, you know what, you can blame, you can blame a lot of people for the way in which you were raised, but you can only blame yourself for the way you choose to live today. Because by the power of the Lord in your life, you have the power to make the changes and to forget the past, just as Paul has mentioned. Now, what she had were wounds from her past that then became scars, but they weren't still open wounds. They weren't still open wounds where she was bleeding in life, you know, emotionally from all of this. They were now scars that she could talk about with other women in ministry. Value the present over the past. And I want to challenge you folks. Oswald Chambers says, beware of spending too much time looking back at what you once were when God wants you to become something you have never been. Beware of spending too much time looking back at what you once were when God wants you to become something you have never been. Hmm. So the truth is, folks, we model what we value. And the challenge for you is to have to put people over things. In our society, it's so easy to put the things over people. But the people over things, man, they're the relationships we take with us. And then to forget the past and work on the present. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for the joy it has been for me to share in the inadequacy of my words. And Father probably talked too much I pray that whatever was said was through your Holy Spirit, that those who heard were challenged and encouraged this day by the power of the example that they hold in life for you. May you bless and keep these, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.